don't know why it turns off. As we look through this story, I want us to see the two major interruptions that happened in the story. First of all, Jairus makes an urgent request. Jesus has just returned from the other side. The, well, remember last week we talked about Jesus going to the other side of the lake? Now he had returned from the other side, and there was a crowd that welcomed him when he came back to Galilee. And they were all expecting him to come back, so they were happy about it. And Jairus was there, and he came to Jesus openly. He was a lead leader in the synagogue. That means he was a respected Jewish leader. And he fell down at Jesus' feet. Don't miss those words, he fell down. In that culture, to fall down at someone's feet is to give worship. So the synagogue leader is worshiping Jesus. That's rare. He fell down at Jesus' feet and he pleaded with Jesus to come to his house. And he's saying there's something urgent about coming to my house. He pleaded with Jesus to come to his house. He had only an only daughter who was 12 years old and she was dying. I don't know if you've ever experienced uh, an emergency, but when you are in the middle of an emergency and someone you love is dying, there's an urgency in your heart that you can never forget. And that's what this man felt. So Jesus faced an unexpected interruption in verses 43 to 48. It says that Jesus was on his way to Jairus' home. Jesus was going to help Jairus by raising his daughter from her uh, dying, deathbed. But as he's on his way, the crowds were crushing him. Can you imagine people all around him thinking, wow, this is an important person. And the crowds were crushing him, and a woman approached Jesus from behind. Now, just go back and think about where did the synagogue leader approach Jesus? From in front, right? And he bowed down before Jesus at his feet. This woman is crouching, and she's coming from behind. Take note of that. And this woman uh, is approaching Jesus from behind, and she had bleeding for 12 years. How old was, how, how old was Jairus' daughter? 12. And this lady had a disease of bleeding for 12 years. She was hemorrhaging. And, the, and she had spent all of her money on doctors. The Bible doesn't say, forget doctors, go to a faith healer. The Bible says, go to the doctor, and if the doctor can't help, you better ask the Lord to heal you. That's what's going on here. So she had spent all her money on doctors, and she could not be healed by any of them. So you know what she does? From behind, she says, oh, that's Jesus. And she reaches out and touches the end of Jesus' robe. Now, this word is a little bit difficult to explain in our language because we don't have the, uh, the traditions that the Jewish people had. For Jewish people, they would wear prayer shawls. And on these shawls, they would have tassels, uh, little things that hung out from the shawl. And they would usually have 12 on each side. And this lady grabbed his prayer shawl, and she grabbed one of the tassels of his prayer shawl. That's why it says she grabbed the end of his robe. 
the, the tassel that, that was on his prayer shawl. And as she did that, a miracle happened. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. But not only that, not only did her bleeding stop, but Jesus stopped. Remember where Jesus was going? He was on the way to Jairus' house. And he feels this, somebody touched the tassel, and, and, and he stops. And he asks the question in verse 45, who touched me? Well, that's an interesting question. There's a well-known song that people like to sing. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. You know that? Well, this isn't he touched me. It's not a testimony. He touched me. It's a question from Jesus. Who touched me? L not, let me ask you a question. Don't you think Jesus knew who touched him? Why did Jesus ask that question, who touched me? There was something that happened that needed to happen in this lady's life. And Jesus wasn't going to let this incident go without making a deal about it. Jesus asked, who touched me? And everybody denied it. Nobody around said, no, no, not me. And Peter reminded Jesus about how much of a crowd was around him. She said, Peter says, Jesus, there's so many people around you, you could have been touched by anybody. So for, at first some people are saying, no, I didn't touch him. And Peter's saying, everybody could have touched you. But Jesus wasn't satisfied with that. Jesus says, someone touched me. And I know that power has gone out from me. Jesus wanted to find out who that was. And the woman testified about what she had done. She saw in verse seven, uh, 47 that she had been discovered. Jesus knew that someone had touched him, and she felt a sense, oh, he's talking about me. She saw that she was discovered, and then she came, and we get exactly the same word that we find in verse 41. She fell down before Jesus. In other words, she came in front of him and fell down to worship Jesus. And then you know what she did? She declared the reason that she had touched him. She told everybody her testimony. She said, I was bleeding, I have been bleeding for 12 years. And no doctor has been able to help me stop this bleeding. I'm desperate and I needed somebody to help me. So I reached out to Jesus and when I reached out to Jesus, immediately I was healed. And she declared the reason she had touched him, and she declared how she had instantly been healed. And then Jesus spoke to her. And Jesus says, your faith has saved you. Now I want you to understand this word saved can be used in different ways. Jesus wasn't talking about her being saved from sin at this point. Her faith had saved her from her illness. Does that make sense? Your faith has saved you, Jesus says. Go in peace. Her faith in Jesus had saved her from her problem of bleeding. And then in verses 49 to 56, we find the second interruption. Jesus is still on the way to Jairus' home. This lady has 
has interrupted him on his emergency call, and, and he stopped to, to touch her and to talk to her, and th now he's still on his way. And as on his way, verse 49, Jesus was still speaking to this woman, and someone came from the synagogue leader's house. And they spoke to Jairus, and they said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Have you ever felt that it was over? That there was no hope? No chance for you at all? That's what he felt. That it was too late. Nothing was going to change. And Jesus heard this, verse 50, and when he heard it, he answered him. Who did he answer? To Jairus. He said, do not be afraid. There's a mom here today that needs to hear those words. Do not be afraid. You're afraid about a hundred things. What your kids are doing, what your kids aren't doing, what your husband's doing, what your husband isn't doing. You're, you're worried and afraid about a lot of stuff. But Jesus said, don't be afraid. And then he said, only believe. And that believe is the same word as Jesus used to say to that other woman, your faith. Believe, faith, that's the same word. Only believe and she will be saved. Again, saved is the same word. That one woman was saved from bleeding and this girl could be saved from death. And Jesus came to the house. And it's interesting, he didn't let people in. The only, in general, nobody was let, let in. But in specific, there were a few exceptions. Peter, John, and James. Isn't it interesting that they're the two, they're the three guys that were allowed to be on the Mount of Transfiguration? They're the guys who, that were the inner circle of the disciples. Peter, James, and John were let in, and the child's father and the child's mother. Can you imagine Jesus coming, and here's Jairus and his wife, who's the mother of the child. We don't know her name, but she's the mother of this child that has just died, a 12-year-old. And Jesus and three of his disciples, and that's the only people in the room. And the people outside are wailing. Now, we don't do this at our funerals. But in Middle East funerals, there are actually people who are paid to wail. And they wail loud. And they wail long. And it almost makes you sad just because they're wailing. And there were people wailing outside, crying and mourning for her. And Jesus gave them instruction. Stop it. Quit. Stop crying. Why? Because she is not dead, but asleep. Now, there's something that we have to understand about what Jesus was saying. Jesus was not naive. Jesus knew that the girl was dead. But there is a special way of talking about death for Christians that you see throughout the New Testament. And you know what that way of talking about Christians is? that when they have died, they are asleep. And why does Jesus use this word for someone who has died, they are asleep? It's because when you are sleeping, everybody expects that you're going to wake up. 
and that when you have died believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, they, we say you have fallen asleep. Why? Because everybody expects that at the resurrection you will wake up. That's a whole picture that we lose. And I am not against uh, cremation, but I'm, I'm willing to say that sometimes when we cremate people, we lose the picture. When you have a body lying in a casket, it looks like they're asleep. And that's supposed to remind us of the New Testament term about sleeping as, the, as death is sleep, and it's supposed to remind us that these people will wake up at the resurrection. And when you go to the graveyard, most graveyards are very careful to put the faces of the, of the dead loved ones facing east. You know why? Because that's where the Lord's going to come from. And they're going to wake up facing east, where Jesus has come from. And when we, when we don't think about these pictures, we lose some of the meaning of our ceremonies. So Jesus says, stop crying because she is not dead, but asleep. Sleeping people can wake up. And the people laughed at him. Oh, Jesus, he's just lost his senses. He knew where she was dead. And then you know what he did? He took the girl by the hand. Wait a minute, she's still a corpse. And for a Jewish rabbi to touch a corpse was not appropriate. You didn't do that. You would become unclean. But Jesus reached out and he touched her. He took her by the hand. And he called out, Child, get up. And you know what happened? Her spirit returned to her. That's how we have an understanding that when you die, your spirit leaves you. Her spirit returned to her, and she got up at once. When Jesus heals, there's an instant transformation. When Jesus healed the lady, she was instantly healed from her bleeding. When he, Jesus healed the girl, she was instantly raised from the dead. And Jesus ordered that she be given something to eat. Why? Well, you get really dead, hungry when you're dead. No, you don't. Why did Jesus order that she be given something to eat? To prove that she's alive. Dead people don't eat. To prove that she was alive. And he, her parents were astounded. And Jesus instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Why? Because a miracle is supposed to be an unusual event. If miracles happened every day to every person, guess what? Miracles would no longer be special. Jesus wanted this miracle to be a special event, and this miracle wasn't he wasn't planning to go and empty out the graveyards, go and empty out the hospitals, go and empty out. That wasn't the purpose for him to be there. He was there to show that he had power and authority over sickness and death, and he did miracles to demonstrate that. But not everybody was supposed to know about what happened. People are like children. If one miracle is good, then many miracles would be better. <laughs> no, miracles are supposed to be special events, not common occurrences. What do we learn from these two, two stories when Jesus was interrupted? Jesus has the authority 
over any interruption. In fact, when he was interrupted by the lady who was bleeding, that enabled that other girl to die so he could raise her from the dead. Jesus has authority over any interruption. And Jesus has authority over sickness and death. It's Mother's Day. And I wanted to come up with two special messages for moms. So moms, this part's especially for you. From what I've learned from the whole story that I just told you. First message for moms. Are you listening? Jesus is never too busy for you. That lady reached out to touch the tassel of his prayer shawl. She was interrupting Jesus from a very uh, special work that he was doing. But Jesus took time to stop and to meet her need. Never think that Jesus is too busy taking care of the world that he can't stop and take care of your need, whatever it is. Moms, Jesus is never too busy to stop and take care of your need when you ask him, when you reach out to Jesus with your need. He'll always stop and listen to you. Number two. No circumstance is too hopeless for Jesus to bring salvation. When they thought this girl was dead, they thought it was all over. But this story proves that there's no situation where it's all over. They have this crazy uh, statement that some people say, it's not over till the fat lady sings. Have you ever heard that? I have news for you. It's not over until Jesus says it's over. No matter what you're concerned about, no matter what you're worried about, no matter which children are on your heart and mind, no matter what problem you have, bring it to Jesus. And when you bring it to Jesus, know that there's no problem too big for him to solve. It's not over until Jesus says it's over. Two lessons for mom. Jesus is never too busy for you. And no circumstance is too hopeless for Jesus to save. So mom, I'm going to ask you to do something today. I'm going to ask you to open your heart to the Lord Jesus. Tell him what's on your heart. Tell him what's concerning you. So to speak, reach out and touch his prayer shawl. And I'm not going to do it for you. You need to do it. We're going to take a moment of silence and I'm going to ask the moms to reach out And touch Jesus. He's here. Let's take a moment of silence. You, you reach out and do it. Lord, I thank you that the, there's nothing that's beyond your ability to change, to bring life and healing into every situation. Help us to trust you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the boys to come forward. To we want to.